Hey class, welcome back. Alright, so today we're going over stuff that you need for the kill. Okay, so today we're going to talk about some stuff that you need for the kiln. Going over a few things, such as I've got a, a large assortment of firing cones, I've got some kiln shells, some stilts, some. Got a big old shark going over some stuff that you need to know about firing. All right, let's get started. Hi, class. Mr. G here going over some kiln stuff and things that we need to know and discuss about how these things. All right, so going over the first couple things, let's go over some the materials and, mat and things that you're going to be using for kilns. If you're going to be firing, uh, you got to have most of this stuff to, to get to get your firing started. Uh, number one is the kiln shells themselves. All right, so this is a uh, this is a kiln shelf. Uh, this is a half octagon one because of the type of kiln that I have. Uh, I like the octagon ones a lot more because it's, it's more for handle grip. Uh, they have ones that are like these half moon uh, disc pieces that are they're great. I like them a lot. Um, these one. Uh, they're they're like 50 pounds for just one shelf uh they're very they're very heavy um but it's like an inch thick piece of ceramic tile that you're gonna set the wear on for to fire your pieces and notice how uh, notice this side how it's that nice uh off cream color to this side which is that white uh, almost porcelain type color and the reason the difference is is because when it comes out of the factory it comes out in that off cream color on top of here I have kiln wash on top of here I have some kiln wash and what I do is I buy you know a, a good amount of this um, I try and buy it you know every couple of years and what it is it re firms the top of the shelf so that if I have a piece that's on top of there such as this bowl uh, it, nothing sticks to the piece, so so the uh, the kiln shelf works kind of as a protectant. It's kind of like um, Pam or aluminum foil for your kiln, and the stuff that's in here it's got aluminum hydrate in it, which makes it to where the if glaze touches it, if a piece gets stuck to the kiln shelf, it'll pop off because it's, it is it's affixed to the kiln shelf after the first firing. However, uh, it will crack and flake off, which is a good thing because it comes off if the piece is stuck to the kiln. You can just uh, either A, use a chisel or uh, some other tool to pry that stuff off. Notice how I've got little bits of glaze that are stuck to here as well. So I can just use a chisel tool and I mean, Uh, but it flakes right off, comes right off the top of the shelf, and it doesn't really damage the shelf too bad. It keeps, it doesn't break the shelf. It keeps the majority of, of stuff pretty cohesive there. Uh, and the reason you want to use that kiln wash is so that you have that extra layer of protection, especially if you're using, uh, if you have kids that put on a really he thick, heavy coat of glaze. Uh, I try and make sure that my students are using a, you know, the three coats max, uh, so the pieces, so nothing melts off, and you have this big puddle of glaze at the bottom, which is a very big problem. Uh, but that that helps make sure that you have no issues when firing. Okay, next thing you're gonna need is some stilts. So over here I got a couple sets of stilts. They come in a few variety of sizes, such as the wee, the wee bit bigger, and also the freaking huge. All right, so these uh, these aren't the only sizes. I've got some that are kind of like a medium grade, a little more medium grade comes in different sizes like this, but uh, these are the sizes that I use typically. Now they also come with uh, one that's like half of the Wii size here, and you need at least three per shelf. Uh, what's that mean? I'm gonna show you guys in a minute on how we stack and how we add to our shelves so that things come, we can build. Now when using these stilts in conjunction with the kiln shells, uh, you also have a few other things that you have in here, such as the wedge. I'll use the wedge when I'm doing a, um, if I'm slowly heating up the piece. Uh, this is used as a prop over the lid, so as you close the lid, it'll sit just wedged open just enough to vent out. Um, if you have a lot of wet clay inside of it and you're you doing a pre-bake where you put it on low and you let it kind of sit on low overnight and leave that lid cracked, the temperature inside the kiln shouldn't really get above about 100, 150 max, uh, which is hot and toasty, but it is cool enough to where it's not really going to do a lot to the wear that's inside of it. 
but it will take out most of the physical water because inside the kiln you have a lot of physical water that didn't dry out so if you put in a uh, leather hard to almost fresh piece of clay you can fire it it's just how you fire it so you want to work on that stuff slowly by putting the wedge in there you're letting the atmosphere of that moisture and stuff vent out of the kiln so as it heats up the steam rises out the steam comes out of the top of the lid instead of keeping it trapped inside that piece because if you're keeping water vapor trapped inside a piece those coils the heating elements that are in there is going to put water on top of those and that's not going to be a good safe thing either so make sure that you're using one of these if you're doing one of those uh those bakes and just make sure that everything's uh working just right uh last couple things we have we have plugs which are these little uh road cone looking pieces of clay they come in various sizes but basically if it's if it's for the side holes of your kiln the reason that you use these is if you're gonna uh change the temperature of your kiln uh more rapidly so what i do is i keep one of these in the top hole usually there's three holes lift the lid there's three holes right underneath it i keep it right under the lid handle and the reason for as that stuff heats over time it will start to erode the handle because you have like five six hundred degree heat coming out of those vent holes and it's just melting away at that you know aluminum ha aluminum handle and it's just wears over time so i keep this in there just to kind of protect the handle uh but also if I'm doing a high fire, I need to plug up all my vent holes because I want to make sure that the temperature gets up without just staying on for seven, eight days. Uh, so use these vent holes to make sure that your kiln's heating up faster. But don't put them in during a bisque firing unless it's in that top one, like I said, to protect the handle. It's because you're trying to vent out the atmosphere, but you want to vent it slowly. If you put it in and you have an old manual kiln and you crank it to high, it's going to go from that like thousand degree range up to 1500 pretty fast and that could make some of your wear pop so make sure that as you plug these up you're conscientious of how you're raising that temperature and you're raising it up slowly and not too fast where your wear will pop last two things are the kiln stilts uh these are also other stilts that are not the same as these ones these ones are for those students who glaze a piece of pottery uh all over and they didn't leave any part unglazed all right, so in front of me, I have two examples of pieces that I've had my, that my students have made. One is this vessel piece, one is this cup. Now, for the piece, the, the vase piece here, when you glaze a piece, make sure you're glazing all sides except for the bottom. If you have a little bit of glaze on the bottom, that's not really that bad. It's, it's not good, like you wanna make sure it's as clean as possible, but if you get a little bit on there, it's not that bad because as I said before, before you have the kiln wash to pop it off just in case. So you notice I got a little bit of like a white fleck here. It's from the kiln wash itself, perfectly fine, not a big deal. For those students who decided that they wanted to make sure that their whole piece was glazed, including the bottom, this is a problem because this will get stuck to the kiln shelf. So what you do is you have the stilt, which is a little tri, little stand piece. I cover mine in kiln wash just as an extra protective, just so everything comes out fine. And you just balance it on top of the piece like so. Works perfectly, you, they can glaze the whole glaze the whole piece, which again, I don't recommend that they do. However, some people do it, and sometimes it's kind of a necessary evil for the piece. And you can also, what's nice about these, you can take a couple of them, make little pattern things down at the bottom. Let's like put six or seven of these things down that you can set on there, and everything's lifted off of the shelf. That's the important thing. You wanna make sure it's off the shelf. However it attaches to make sure it's off the shelf is what you need to do. Uh, and I keep mine in like a little bowl next to my kiln. So if I have, you know, a kid who just accidentally did the whole bottom, I can just slap it on there. Um, I'll deduct points from their grade, but you know, their piece will still get fired. And that's what matters. <clears throat> so last thing is this. This is kind of important stuff. And the reason I, I am big on the alumina hydrate is it's a chemical that if you're, wherever you're buying your kiln items, wherever you're buying your ceramic pieces they should sell chemicals if they're selling chemicals one of the things that you need to get is aluminum hydrate why do you need this stuff and why have i said it like seven times reason being is because this is like your best insurance policy if things go wrong uh, as i said before the kiln wash itself this stuff is inside of it and what that does is this is a white fine powder it looks a lot like plaster um the thing about this stuff that you all need to know is that this does not melt until it reaches three thousand degrees <coughs> now.
Now with this stuff not heating, not melting until 3000 degrees, that kind of ensures that you can use it on whatever part of the kiln that you want and it's not gonna stick, that is imperative. Now what I do is when I'm stacking my stilts on top of the shelf, let's say I hit a pocket that where it doesn't wanna sit flush, and but this is where I need to put the stilt, uh, I can take a little bit of raw clay, roll it in the alumina, alumina hydrate, uh, make like a little sausage out of it, pop it down on the kiln, pop the stilt on top of that, or pop it on the top and have it level to when I put the next kiln shelf on, it flows fine. When firing is done, take the kiln shelf off, you'll have that little nugget of clay that's covered in the white dust, toss it in the trash, and move on. That's why this stuff is kind of necessary evil. You really gotta buy a, a, like a, and again, this is just a pound bag. It should last you about 20 years. You don't need to buy this stuff often, just, uh, just when you need it. But it's a great thing to have. Let's go over how to load a kiln. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how to load a kiln. So when you are loading a kiln, let's start off with the basics, which is the very bottom of the kiln. Now, I always have a couple extra kiln shelves that I keep at the very bottom of my kiln. Now, you have two options for this. You can either A, buy one large round board that covers the bottom of your kiln. Now, when I say the bottom, you're gonna have about an inch gap between the kiln shelf and the heating elements. You're gonna have that little bit of space there. That's fine, not a big issue. If you don't have one of those large discs, you can use one of your, you can use two of your normal kiln shelves just fine. Now, when you're doing this, you have two types, two options that you can do. Option A, if like me, we fire a lot, so I need that space because I need to fire a bunch of pieces. Option two, if you have not, if you're not firing a lot of pieces all at once, you do, you can lift the kiln shelf up some on some refractory bricks. Now the refractory bricks are not made. Now refractory brick. This stuff is not refractory brick. This light stuff, if it's light and it feels like it's made of uh, styrofoam, that's not refractory brick. Refractory brick feels the same as this. It's the nice, dense, thick clay material. Uh, not this stuff. This stuff is the big. The big difference is if we look at the textures of the two bricks, the. Um, refractory brick, which is the kiln shelf material, it is solid clay, there is no holes in it whatsoever. The other brick, which is used for heat, heat radiation, this this uh, has a lot of holes in it. What they do is they take clay and they um, smash it with um, sawdust, and when the sawdust burns out of the clay, it creates this nice light brick, so it's light and it's easy to move and manipulate and you can carve it, and actually quite good. Uh, but it's also very brittle. Uh, because of all those holes. Now, after you have two shells on the bottom, again, you can either hold them up, put a nice refractory book, or put it on its side, and just use three in a little triangle formation, level them uh, so that you can put your shelves on there just to give it that little bit of height. Once you have a base level of those, then you can go ahead and start working on building the wear and building it up. Okay, so now you're, you have your base level started on your kiln, your kiln shelves. What you're gonna do is you're gonna start off with the shortest level that you possibly can. This gives you greater stability. Now, taking my kiln stilts, I'm gonna set two across from each other, two more on each of the sides. Two more across, and two more across. Now, mo all my, both of my kiln shelves now, both of my kiln shelves are married right next to each other. I have two stilts directly across from each other, all four sides, so that way I can easily balance my... Now, when loading the kiln shelves on, as you lean over the kiln, do not put your weight onto the onto the wall of the kiln. You want to distribute your weight through your toes and lean over the kiln to carefully set it on top of those stilts. Now, I will say this, as I'm loading kiln shelves, I usually stack them right on top of each other so that I'm not crisscrossing them across so that I have my lines from one way across. You probably could. I don't. If you want to try it and it all you know, falls apart, I, I didn't tell you to, okay? I, I'm saying, you know, use your own judgment. I'm loading on the other side, leaning forward. Carefully setting those kiln shelves on again. Wait through the toes. I'm not leaning on the table or leaning on the kiln shelf here. Now, once you have that base section done where you have the lowest kiln shelf, kiln levels that you have, 
then you can use the taller ones. Now you can either go for the mid range, mid ones here, and I'll just add those around the four sides. And I'll use the tall ones on this side, so you guys can see the difference between the two. That's perfectly fine. You can offset them. That's fine, as long as you're making sure that all your, your lines are being butted up as close to each other as possible. That way you can make sure that structural integrity isn't being compromised. So I have this next level up. I can put my wear on, set my shelf on top. Now, you notice that I'm doing four stilts per shelf. I could do three. I could just do one in the middle here and just have these three supporting it. That's fun. Me, I have extra kiln stilts and I like a little insurance on my stuff. So I'm gonna put on extras. Now, why do I not do them in the middle? There's nothing saying I can't do it there. However, when you're loading pieces, usually you don't have a free space in the middle. You have them at the edges. So put your kiln stilts in at the first. Now also, notice how I'm putting the kiln stilts on before I'm putting the shelf on. This is how I normally would load a kiln. I'll put my stilts on first. I'll take all of my wear and I'll just add it in like so. And when you're putting pieces together, when I have my, uh, in my firebox, I'll have a load of the kids' pieces that they're working on. I'll take one of my stilts and I'll put it next to the piece to make sure that it doesn't exceed the shelf that I'm loading at the time. Some people don't think about this, so I feel like I gotta tell you. Uh, now, you can stack stilts on top of stilts. I don't recommend this just because it's not as structurally stable as an actual kiln stilt itself. If you have pieces that your students are building that are larger than the stilts that you have, change the project or go buy some stilts that are the right size. If you've done this for years and you haven't had any problems, good for you. However, for those that are new and that are, if you guys are watching the video, I'm going with the assumption that you guys need some assistance in this. So try and not push the boundaries past what you think you can do, okay? Give it a couple of practice runs before you take it. Now, loading up this last shelf here. Now, as I said before, you can have them offset. However, where they're lining up, they're lining up right on top of each other on the side. And that's what you want to see. You want to have that even cohesion as you're loading so you have nothing overbalanced one over the other. Make sure your kiln shelves are clean, meaning there's no uh, extra glaze on them. These ones I have to, after this last fire, I need to go back and uh, re-add some new kiln wash to them and crack off the extra glazes and then apply a single thick coat, thick, not thin, thick coat on top of the kiln shelves themselves, so that way it makes sure that they're good for the next firing. And finally, after you have completely loaded your kiln, now it's time to unload your kiln. And how do you store a kiln shelf? That's another thing. So once you take the... Now what I do is we're gonna pretend that this chair here is the wall. Uh, you can go out and you can get some PVC pipe and you can build a little storage like bracket system that they can sit in. Uh, but I'm cheap and uh, I use what's around me a lot of the time. And what I do is when I set them against the wall, make sure they're flush slightly with the wall, you know, let them angle out a little bit. And I set mine off, center just slightly off of each other so that as I'm loading them on, I just stagger the kiln shelves back and forth. That way they have enough weight on the one prior, but not all their weight. Because I wanna make sure that these things aren't getting bumped and tipped, but they're just slightly off each other so there's not any unnecessary rubbing or weight distribution. So, Unloading the kiln shells, make sure they're slightly off stacked and that you've taken care of. Try and keep a cohesive nature to the where you're putting those kiln stilts. That way it's easy to find what you're looking for. I have mine set up in series of which ones I'm using. So like each one of these I know holds four, so I keep mine in four sets when I'm using them. That way I don't misplace any kiln stilt, uh, like these little baby ones, my wee ones. Uh, keep them in groups of four so that I can easily just kind of pick up a set, grab it, load that shelf if necessary, and move on. 
keep you things nearby and keep everything kind of neat and somewhat organized and it'll make sure that you guys are firing just fine. Hey class, I'm, I'm hope that you like this, uh, this quick tutorial on how to actually load a kiln. Uh, next time we're gonna go over some cones and the firings of the kiln because I've gotten a lot of questions about that. Uh, as always, if you guys have a comment, raise your hand in the comments below. If you have a... Uh -huh. As always, if you guys have a question, raise your hand in the comments below. And as all, and uh, until then, I'll see you guys next class. Later, guys.